At some point, the British Museum organized an exhibition focusing on the Greek statues it has borrowed from Greece proper and other areas of Hellenic influence uh, throughout the world with the title, The Body Beautiful. Such interest it steered that the BBC itself promoted the event with an art historian professor praising the influence of, Greek, uh, of the Greeks in the way they presented their art and in the way that the whole world today, even to this day, assesses a well-defined body. We have all heard the term, he looks like a Greek god, or she looks like a Greek goddess, if he or she is in perfect form. Well, during the recording, the art historian strolls around statues in the museum, such as that of the discus thrower, Heracles, Aphrodite, and many, many other uh, works of art, uh, extolling the virility and beauty of their forms, the beauty that their forms emanate. But there is something terribly amiss. Focused on the bodies alone, she makes no reference to the faces. And what is infinitely sadder is that her English diction renders her completely incapable of uttering the word, the Greek word for statue, which is agalama. For any Greek culture or art reaching Albion was filtered through the cruder Romans at the time. The art historian, therefore, resorts to the simplistic lexis of statue from the Latin statua, meaning standing, unmoving, something static, which in itself is a derivative borrowed from the Greek verb istimi, to stand, meaning to stand. Nor does she possess the vocabulary rendering her capable of distinguishing between a marble image of a historical figure, or per se a bust, and that of an idealistic representation of an athlete or god, which in Greek, Greek does make the distinction Andriandas for the former, and then Agalma for the latter, and Andriandas representing the Andras, the man, the historical figure, and the Agalma, something beyond reality, something ideal of an athlete or a god. Besides, how could she use any of these words? English, as any other European language apart from Greek, never experienced the civilization that set the standards for the unsurpassable beauty of the human form. That being said, to the Greek perception of things, there is no such thing as immobility in agalmata. There is no statua in a Greek agalma, for it is made to not only represent movement, but to also move the onlooker and take him or her to a higher plane of existence, lift him, to uplift him to a higher plane of thought. And although Greek civilized barbaric yelps with higher diction and notions like music, harmony, democracy, even telephone, uh, etc. It failed to Hellenize non-Greeks to the point of adopting the meaning and the culture behind the Greek agalma. Prerequisite to achieving this is the development of a highly philosophical and anthropocentric civilization largely untainted by dogmatic fundamentalism, imbued with the unimaginativeness of nomadic desert peoples or new world ideologies that bestow equal value on art, whether monstrous or beautiful, as evident, as evident in galleries and museums of modern art, where a man standing over a pile of dung may refer to himself as a work of art. Because, therefore, only the Greek worldview and language can elevate a human uh, being to, to the measure of excellence, let us focus on the psychagogia, the soul guidance of the unique institution of the Greek agalma. Besides, through the etymology of the very word agalma, we may understand that its objective is to steer agaliasis, which is a derivative of the word, meaning sheer pleasure in the onlooker, uh, uplifting the soul to the ideal world of beauty and truth where no flaw can be found. That is the purpose of the Greek statuary, the classical type. Through the process of shedding any imperfections, in contrast to the Andriandus, as I mentioned earlier, meaning statues of historical figures, the Agalma transcends the reality of the physical world and guides us beyond it. The root of the word itself 
stems from the verb ayin, which means to lead, to guide. It functions in many derivatives in Greek, such as agogi, which means education, and diagogi, meaning upbringing, manners, behavior, and therefore states how a person should endeavor to exist in the natural world. The serene coolness of the faces, of the perfect faces, in conjunction with a well-defined virility of the body in these agalmata, represent intellectual sobriety, physical excellence, and the restraint that a human must exercise with the objective of his or her own agalmatization, if you allow me the term. Intellectual sobriety imposes itself on the uncontrollable elements of the physical world, mirrored in the faces, in the facial serenity that defies any physical exertion of his statues of the body's dynamic stance, as it is evident in works like Myron's Discus Thrower. Uh, even the male genital, uh, genitals are represented as disproportionately small to make the statement that basic passions must be kept in check, must be curbed, so that they may not function to the detriment of intellect, the intellect and spirituality in the course of one's life. One should not succumb to his lower passions. Essentially, the Greek agalma clearly states that man should be a nexus between the material and spiritual world, the physical world and the spiritual world, the intellectual world, the body being the sensor of the former and the intellect of the latter. One's mental lucidity depends on this balance, according to the Greeks, and a balanced individual is truly talented since the very word talent, which is also Greek origin, literally means balance. Uh, because the word talandevo in Greek, the verb, means to be able to balance between two things. Thus, one who is talented balances perfectly between extremes and functions in harmony in what he or she does, whether it's playing the piano, the trumpet, or being an athlete, balance is key to excellence. The juxtaposing geometry, therefore, applied in the stance of classical Greek statuary, agalmata, such as that of the discus thrower, which I mentioned earlier, represents the balance between the pulling and pushing forces that ordain the momentum of our ever-evolving world and man's position in it, as one whose composure should be unaffected by the turbulence of these forces. The equal distribution of these antagonistic forces in the statuary bestow the incomparable beauty and harmony upon these works, which clearly resonate the Greek kalokagathia. Kalos, meaning beautiful, and agathos, which means virtuous, therefore beauty of virtue, which created, uh, that produced for us the tenet of a healthy mind in a healthy body, in Greek, nousi yis and somati yi. Sculptor mathematician Polycletus, for instance, applied such geometric division on his work, Dodiphoros, the spear bearer, that although simply a standing figure, the agalma itself seemed to be on the verge of movement as an athlete poised ready for action. So harmonious was the result that it was dubbed as the canon, the rule, for other sculptors to follow. And to this day, most standing statues bear weight on the one leg uh, the, uh, whereas the other one is lighter. And you can see the juxtaposition and the dimensions of the statue as presented in the work as if it's ready to move, ready to come to life. Therefore, the institution of Greek statuary makes it clear that incomplete is a man who does not endeavor to fulfill his full potential by either neglecting the body or neglecting his intellect. And as such, agalmata will forever dictate measure the measure of human dignity towards which we must all strive. They will forever stand in rebuke of excessive bellies as indications of decadence and lack of restraint. Until the end of time, they will condemn alterations and deformations to the body as the temple of the soul that it is, and state that tattoos, perforations, and excessive jewelry are barbaric practices by those lacking spirituality and intellectuality. Uh, in their effort to fulfill the void. In a nutshell, they will perennially remind us of our flaws.
Maybe this is why during the blight of monotheism, they were destroyed by the vulgar, since ugliness is more facile than the effort required to reach such a high standard of culture and art. And when we once again found them, buried and fragmented, we stored them in museums. However, what we could not incarcerate was their facial serenity. The facial serenity of their transcendental gaze in defiance of all worldly events, and which may still be seen in the faces of Byzantine icons of Holy Mary, Christ, and the saints in any Greek Orthodox Church. However, these icons will always be overshadowed by the three-dimensional Greek figures that portray man or woman as both virile and fighting fit, as well as spiritual and intellectual unlike the emaciated, worm-like caricatures adorning church walls nowadays. Plato himself even went as far as using the guiding dictates of the human form as it is uh, uh, manifested in Greek statues, in Greek marble, to exemplify the idea of the perfect state, something that may even be of use to us today in shaping the desired political life in our societies. He did this by likening the way a state is organized to the healthy human form as portrayed by the Greek Agalba. He likened the face and head to leadership, the chest uh, to the executive branch, uh, the police, the military, the public servants, the judicial system, and the abdomen to the workforce, the people. When these members function according to their own virtues, the result can only be the desired development and prosperity for all. The head, according to Plato, must host a virtue, the virtue of wisdom, wise leaders, as manifested in the spiritual composure of the face of this Greek agalmata. The chest must strive for bravery and discipline, as obvious in its well-defined thorax, musculature. And the stomach must exercise restraint, as evident in, in the uh, absence of any belly fat in the statues in the abdominal region. By the same token, leaders must be wise, the head, and just. The military, the police, and the public servants, and the judicial system uh, must be prime examples of discipline who adhere to the decisions of the head, to the wisdom of the head, whilst the people look to the above examples, the chest and the head, for guidance and through the education provided by the state, seek the refinement enabling select members of the belly to replenish any needs of the branches above through the process of sifting people into the right positions. Meritocracy, in other words, meritocracy, a meritocratic state. However, whenever one of the three parts deviates from its virtue, whether it expands or dwindles, it does so to the detriment of the rest of the organism. If the head, for example, loses control, the chest or belly might undergo such hypertrophy that aggression and overconsumption may follow respectively. To avoid this, we should always keep in mind the splendid form of the Greek agalma to curb any exaggeration, any hyperbole. Besides, as heirs to the dignity of our glorious past, we must always be attended by the vision splendid, which is to be found in the Greek institution and guidance of the Greek agalma. So here's a new word for you English-speaking friends. Instead of statue, whenever you see something that inspires you, you can refer to it in Greek as agalma, that which uplifts the soul and guides you to perfection, to a world that may not exist in the material world, but in the world of ideals and dreams. Thank you for listening.